Once we have a reasonable understanding of how atoms behave, we have to start looking at how those atoms interact because chemistry is the study of matter and its changes. So those changes require that atoms interact with one another. Almost all of the reactions and interactions that we look at and talk about in chemistry are taking place in the electron clouds around the atoms. The nuclei are very rarely directly involved in a reaction. They're just there as the positive charge um, that defines the atoms that we're working with. Most of the time when we think about the interactions we're looking at, um, we're dealing with electrostatic interactions or Coulombic interactions uh, where opposite charges attract and like charges repel. And the strength of those interactions is usually controlled by the size and the separation of the charges involved. So first of all, let's think about a non-productive interaction, a reaction where there really is no change. Um, because most of the interactions that occur between atoms are this type of interaction. They don't really do much. So right here I've got just sort of a generic cartoon of an atom. I've got a nucleus with a bunch of positive charge in it. I've got an electron cloud and don't count them. The charges don't match, but let's just say they do and this is a neutral atom. So what happens when another atom interacts with this one, but interacts in sort of a casual way, just sort of comes along and doesn't really slam into that atom. We'll have something that looks kind of like that. It's just going to come in. It's going to have negative charges from the electron cloud repelling negative charges from this electron cloud, and it's just going to bounce off or be deflected away. Now, those are probably the interactions that happen most often, but obviously they're not the most exciting interactions. Uh, we want to look at some actual chemical interactions and transformations that occur. So one thing that can happen is electrons can be transferred. So there can be you know, stealing of electrons. If one atom doesn't really attract its electrons very strongly and another atom comes along, what we see is that First of all, those two atoms have to interact strongly enough so that their electron clouds overlap a little bit. And then if this atom attracts electrons a little bit more strongly than this atom, we'll see some of these electrons transfer over and we're left with a negatively charged ion because this one now has extra electrons in its cloud and a positively charged ion which has fewer electrons in its cloud. This is an ionic interaction or often called an ionic bond but really it's the interaction between a positive charge and a negative charge. What if the two atoms that we're talking about share or uh, attract electrons with a fairly similar strength. Well, again, we had an atom come in and there was some collision, some interaction where the electron clouds partially merged. But now, if these nuclei both attract electrons with about the same strength, there's really not enough difference to pull these electrons one way or the other. But now we've got this merged electron cloud in which electrons can just move around and be shared between the two nuclei, between the two atoms that we're working with. This is a covalent bond. So as these electrons move around and are shared amongst these two atoms, we form something called a bond, a covalent bond. How do we predict whether something is going to be more covalent or more ionic. And that's one of the places where periodic table is really going to help us out. So periodic table, um, you know, we've gone through that already. What about ionic compounds? If we have an ionic compound, we usually have something that has a metal and a nonmetal. And those metals and nonmetals are usually 
fairly far apart from each other on the periodic table. So something like potassium chloride, potassium has one extra electron that it really doesn't want to hold on to all that well. Chlorine has a vacancy, is, is one short of an octet of electrons, so it's really going to attract an electron. So potassium and chlorine will interact with an electron transfer that will give us an ionic compound. What about covalent? Covalent compounds are usually uh, two metals, or two nonmetals, excuse me, that are relatively close to each other on the periodic table. So you see, this is where we get a lot of covalent compounds. You also see that hydrogen over here is highlighted in green because hydrogen can behave kind of like lithium, sodium, and potassium and be a plus one cation. Hydrogen can also behave kind of like fluorine, chlorine, chlorine, bromine because if it gains an electron by sharing, it can have a full duet um, as opposed to an octet. So hydrogen is involved in a lot of covalent interactions as well. Now, we had a metal and a non-metal far apart for ionic. We've now got two non-metals that are close together on the periodic table for covalent. There's actually one other type of interaction. What if I've got two metal atoms? What if I've got two potassium atoms that interact with each other? Well, those are going to form something called a metallic bond or a metallic interaction. That happens between two metals, and I think of it as sort of a game of hot potato with the electron. The two potassium ions, or the two potassium atoms, neither one of them really wants to hold on to that outer electron all that strongly, but there's nowhere for it to go. So that outer, those two outer electrons from the two potassium atoms ends up just kind of getting tossed back and forth and circulated around in a metallic bond. Here we've got our types of interactions. The ones we're going to focus on are covalent and ionic. We can always use periodic table to help us find those. So look at some examples, um, work through some problems, and good luck on that.